If you were a Sega Saturn owner back in 1996, Lobotomy Software's Power Slave was mandatory playing. Much of the media at the time rated it as a true showpiece for the hardware. It had a 3D engine that was well beyond Doom and its clones, and also had gameplay that was more akin to Metroid than it was a mindless run-and-gun. Stages were designed to be explored multiple times. As you found new weapons and artifacts, you'd discover new areas you could not access before, creating new paths and enemies to face. You started out with nothing but a sword and a pea shooter fighting spiders, but after a few hours, you were armed with ancient weapons and could fly. It really did show the Saturn in a positive light. It was relatively smooth for a first-person shooter of that era, and the colored light sourcing was cool looking as could be. It had been a stark improvement over similar games we had seen on the Saturn, especially the early stuff like Robotica and Congo the Movie. The Saturn edition wasn't the only version of the game. You could also get a PlayStation port that changed some of the enemies and level design, and a PC edition that used a different graphics engine and was pretty much an entirely different experience. But after Lobotomy Software closed its doors in 1998, any chance of seeing another official Power Slave release was lost to the ravages of time and circumstance. That was until Night Dive Studios and Throwback Entertainment decided to redo the original using the Kex engine and bring it some much needed quality of life improvements in the process. How'd they do? Did this modern take on the original do it any justice at all? In this episode, we will take a look at Power Slave Exhumed and see if it's worth 20 bucks of your hard earned money. Power Slave Exum starts out with a story of an alien invasion hitting the ancient Egyptian ruins of Karnak. A crack team of soldiers is sent in to see what's going on when their helicopter is shot down and they are all wiped out save for one lone warrior. Guided by the ghost of King Ramses, you learn that the Kilmot aliens intend to use the power of his mummified corpse to conquer the world. From that point on, you must move through the area and locate various artifacts to imbue yourself with superhuman powers. These allow you to jump higher and further, breathe underwater for extended periods of time, float down from incredible heights, withstand extreme elements like poison and heat, and eventually the ability to virtually fly around unimpeded by any obstacles. You also find some pretty nifty weapons. It starts out simple, of course, but you'll soon have machine guns, grenades, and eventually the ancient power of the gods themselves. What made Power Slave so unique at the time was the fact the stage design was done in such a way that you needed to explore most places multiple times to find everything. Many areas could not be accessed without the proper artifact or weapon. An overworld map governs the area and shows you where you can and cannot go. Once you open up a stage, it can be played as many times as you want. To make matters more challenging, every time you revisit a stage, enemies do respawn and you must collect the keys all over again. Once you do find a new path, a new stage becomes available. Some paths will lead you to a boss encounter, usually some huge superpowered alien that is surrounded by smaller enemies and environmental dangers. You also have the option of collecting transmitter pieces that are hidden throughout the game. These are perhaps the most important items you'll come across and tend to be quite hard to find. They do have a direct effect on the ending you get. You know which stages have a hidden piece of the transmitter by the beeping sounds you hear. Checkpoints are scattered throughout the game to help mitigate those untimely deaths, of which you'll encounter many. The original graphics engine that drove the Saturn version of Power Slave was Lobotomy Zone Slave Driver. It did an admirable job with the original content, and Night Dive Studios' Kex engine upgrades it incredibly. It now supports widescreen, runs at a rock-solid 60 frames per second, 
has improved colors, textures, sprites, and combined some of the elements that made the Saturn and PlayStation versions unique, like stage and enemy design. The water looks a lot better as well. To put it quite simply, no version of Power Slave before this has looked or ran as nice as it does here. But as impressive as the upgrades are, you are still dealing with two-dimensional sprites for all of the enemies, weapons, artifacts, and pretty much everything else you directly interact with. There is a certain charm to it to be sure, but there is also a feeling of age that betrays the pretty upgrades in other areas. I also found the lighting engine to be disappointing. It lacks the exaggerated color of the Saturn original and sticks more to the way it was done in the PlayStation. In fact, some of the lighting from the Saturn version is missing here entirely. It still looks good, but I was really hoping for more Saturn accurate effects since I enjoyed it so much there. That leaves me sort of torn on Power Slave's modern facelift. It certainly runs better than it ever did on the Saturn and PlayStation, and the polygons are far smoother and prettier. But the lighting engine and the two-dimensional sprites leave me wanting more. I would have loved a toggle to bring back the more colorful lighting effects from the Saturn, and a few new three-dimensional models would have gone a long way, even if it was only reserved for items or the boss characters. In the end, it still looks great, so outside of those few slight letdowns, Night Dive did an overall excellent job. I always loved the sound and music of the original. It was ancient and mystical, giving everything an otherworldly feeling that paired quite well with the atmosphere. Here's a quick snippet to give you a taste of what it offers. <laughs> Critiquing the actual game here pretty much mirrors the original start to finish. It has, for better or worse, all of the same pluses and negatives. For instance, as good a game as this is, it's a slow starter. You begin the game with meager weapons fighting spiders and scorpions, and this lasts far longer than it should. In fact, should you only play Power Slay for 30 or 45 minutes, it's really easy to walk away with an extremely negative opinion of it. It takes a good hour or more to really start to see the brilliance of the level design and meet some enemies that's actually worth fighting. Once you get a few powers, a few more weapons, and fight a boss or two, Power Slave really comes into its own. By the time you get to the end, you'll be armed to the teeth and facing a massive army at every turn. The gulf between the two endings really drives home how important the exploration becomes. If you do not complete the transmitter, well, you basically leave the Earth to be conquered by the Killmod aliens. If you're only looking for the straightforward action of Doom, this one is likely going to disappoint you. The biggest reason to play this is to immerse yourself in its world. Each area is a labyrinthian maze of possibilities. That hidden nook in the distance could hold a much needed life upgrade or a simple ammo replenishment, but it's incredibly fun to discover each one all the same. And unlike most Doom clones of the era, this can be as much a 3D platformer as it is a first-person shooter. Some stages are built completely on the power of your jump, and the traps are deviously clever in punishing you for going too slow or missing a platform. Some areas are so complicated the map is mandatory to get and keep your bearings. If you appreciate that kind of commitment to the material, you'll love Power Slave. Give it a little time to open up, and you'll get a whole lot of game in return.
After spending about eight hours with Power Slave Exhumed, I come away impressed with not only Night Dive's upgrade, but also just how well this game holds up. It was always so much more than some simple Doom ripoff, and it offers hours of thoughtful gameplay that is fun and challenging. My few minor complaints are more personal preference than any real objective critique. This is a well done throwback to a classic that I think many gamers likely missed or overlooked during its initial run. At just $20, it's now available on the Switch, the PC, the PlayStation 4, the PlayStation 5, Xbox One, and Xbox Series S and X. That means pretty much all of you now have a way to play it. I'd also like to mention that I think what Night Dive has done with the Kex engine is quite admirable. This is not a full-on remake where the soul of the game has been altered by modern sensibilities. This represents a close approximation of what it was like to play this game in 1996 on the Saturn and PlayStation. It just looks and runs a whole lot better. This would be an excellent way to bring back many of the games trapped on the Saturn. Fans have wanted a modern option for Shining Force 3, Panzer Dragoon Saga, and Dragon Force for years, and I think this style of remaster is a far better option than a full-on remake. It preserves the original experience in such a way that it's able to live on without alienating its original audience with new art designs, or worse, changing the gameplay that breaks the original appeal. Wanting modern options for older games does not have to be complicated or expensive. Much of the better software holds its own and really just needs a few graphical improvements like widescreen, resolution, and performance boost. Everything else remains strong enough to carry the material to modern audiences just fine. In the case of Power Slave Exhumed, you're gonna get a first-person shooter wrapped up in a Metroid-style adventure. Whether you save the world or fail miserably, you should have a heck of a good time all the same. I'm Sigalord X, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.